America. Uh, and he founded one of the advisory boards uh, for Transparency International. He's also taught at like University of Johns Hopkins and Harvard uh, and Berlin's, I can't really say this, it's Free University, how do you say it? Well, um, Freie Universität, is that what you mean? Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, so yeah, please help me welcome you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, no, it's fine. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's fantastic to be invited here. F at first, I didn't know what it meant to be an impact, uh, impactful person. I only remember that my daughter uh, was the only person who never allowed me in any impact on, on her education. <laughs> but, but she educated me quite severely. Uh, but other than that, I think this is a wonderful initiative of yours, and, uh, and I feel greatly honored and excited that you think that I deserve to, to talk to you. I will be very open and very personal and very informal because you, I think, want to share a little bit the feelings I had and the instincts and the uh, excitement and the, also the failures which I witnessed when I started uh, my career as a civil society activist. In fact, I started um, after the university, after um, uh, working at Georgetown University in, in Washington, D.C., in, in a legal institute. I started very normal. I started uh, at the World Bank, in the legal department of the World Bank. I was a very good soldier in the World Bank. I accepted their rules. I accepted their um, instructions uh, to try to do something useful for uh, the poor people in the world and um, uh, try to contribute a bit to more justice and more peace and more openness in the world um, and um, uh, eventually ended up as uh, a director for East Africa in Nairobi and this is basically when the activities which interest you uh, started. Uh, they started by uh, giving me a very strong sense that everything we were trying to do uh, to uh, promote uh, economic and social development of the countries in Africa, in particular the countries around Kenya, was being undermined by corruption. And I thought um, for a while that this is a very domestic um, thing of um, our partner countries. And therefore, I accepted for a long time, for nearly 20 years, that um, the World Bank had a rule which said this is a local, political, social, cultural affair. You uh, are not allowed to really meddle in these uh, things. And uh, I was quite happy about this policy of the World Bank. In fact, it's enshrined, as some of you may know, in the charter of the World Bank. I was particularly happy when I was working on countries which were not particularly popular in the West at the time, because as you know, the United States is uh, very influential at the World Bank, and therefore, when I worked on Tanzania, for instance, where uh, Julius Nyerere at the time was trying to um, promote justice and uh, more equitable development, uh, not many people in the World Bank and in the board of the bank did, uh, liked it. But, of course, there was a rule, we don't meddle in the internal affairs of our partner country. So I was able to help uh, Julius Nyerere and his government in the most uh, insane policies, which some people would say nowadays, like the Ujamaa policies, uh, and the World Bank uh, did not try to prevent it. Uh, but later, uh, after 20 years in other countries, in Latin America and Asia, I found that um, this um, refusal of the World Bank to get involved in politics, to get involved in the question of democracy, of participation of the people, the question of integrity uh, of uh, the leadership in many of the countries, that this was a mistake. It was a mistake of the World Bank, I thought. And uh, therefore, um, after a few years in Nairobi, uh, 
where I saw uh, that uh, very bad projects were being promoted by um, the um, representatives of companies from, uh, from the north, from Europe, from Germany, but also from Canada, from Japan, from the US. Many of these projects um, were driven by an unholy alliance between uh, these promoters from the north and um, uh, corrupt decision makers in Africa. I saw this uh, very clearly in projects like huge uh, hydropower projects, for instance, where we knew that they would not only be uh, useless for um, the economy, say, of Kenya, uh, but that they would even be uh, very damaging. They would be damaging to the environment, they would be damaging for the people, for hundreds of thousands of people who would be resettled for um, undermining, for instance, uh, underwater, uh, under, uh, underground uh, uh, water flows, which uh, would uh, basically destroy the uh, conditions of the Samburu and the uh, Turkana people in the north with their cattle. Um, we saw this and, uh, and we rejected those projects as uh, a project for the donor community. But we saw that as soon as we rejected a project, it was a consortium of uh, commercial banks, of export financing agencies, of um, the banks of the suppliers from Germany, and from UK, France, who um, then very quickly funded these projects. Uh, projects which uh, were even more expensive than the ones which we had rejected, which uh, didn't have the safeguards which normally come with World Bank and donor finance projects. And uh, so I saw how through corruption, um, projects were driven into the developing world which uh, were basically uh, destroying the economic potential um, and the potential of the people in these countries. I very quickly noticed that um, probably these uh, white elephant projects which were useless uh, if not damaging uh, were the main reason for the misery and the poverty and the environmental destruction and so on in many of these countries in Africa and Latin America and Asia. So suddenly I began to uh, doubt that uh, the refusal of the World Bank to develop an anti-corruption program for its partner countries was um, uh, very uh, damaging to our mandate. So I began to uh, develop concepts uh, because many even companies from Germany and so on, they complained that there was too much demand for corruption. So I said, why don't we help these companies so they don't have to bribe anybody by uh, organizing a uh, coalition uh, of uh, companies, supplier companies, um, to make sure that they all stop bribing at the same time. So that was the idea which I had in 88, 89. And in fact, I made a speech to a, um, a meeting of all resident representatives of the World Bank in Swaziland, uh, all the resident representatives in Africa. And to my great delight, about 15 of my colleagues totally agreed and said, why don't we get together and design a systemic approach on how to stop corruption, uh, to stop in particular uh, international corruption in, um, uh, in our countries. The interesting thing was that after a very brief um, uh, period, after about two or three weeks, um, I received a memorandum from the legal department of the World Bank which said, uh, you are not allowed to stop corruption. Uh, this is not our mandate. This is, as I said in the beginning, this is a local matter, this is a political matter, and therefore we are not allowed to look into this. Now, um, I thought, um, I can do this after business hours, after five o'clock every day. And I continued the work as a, in, on my own free time. And before I knew it, I received a memorandum from the president of the World Bank this time, who said, um, what you are doing is uh, embarrassing. It is silly, it is romantic, it is unprofessional. Uh, for us at the World Bank, this is uh, rather shameful to have one of our directors do, do, do this kind of stuff. So we want you to stop this immediately. So I had a choice to either stop corruption, uh, pipe, 
or to, um, to leave the bank. But at that time, I was living with my late wife who um, was working as a doctor in various clinics in, uh, in the slums of, uh, of uh, Nairobi and so on. And uh, she experienced that uh, a health project which we had funded and which we had designed um, so that she, in her clinic, uh, which was run by a Red Crescent organization, um, uh, a clinic uh, for, against, uh, against AIDS, that this clinic never was built. They basically tore down an old ramshackle building and um, uh, created space for that, for that AIDS clinic. But the money never came. So I called the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance. I called the Minister of Health, uh, who, by the way, was later the president of Kenya, Mr. Kiwaki. I said, where is the money? And they said, oh, yeah, we just send it uh, to, to the other ministry. And uh, I don't know, I check it and so on. And for about a year, this uh, money didn't come. In the meantime, the slums closed over the space which they had created. And my wife gave me a very hard time. She said, this rule which you have there at the World Bank is totally inhumane and unacceptable. You impose so many conditions on, on, on Africa and Latin America and Asia, on subsidies, on interest rates, on exchange rates, and so on. And now suddenly, when it comes to corruption, you, uh, you turn a blind eye to what is happening in, in this world. So it was um, this pressure partly from home, um, uh, but also the pressure from uh, partners who, uh, like myself, had started to look at corruption as one of the most damaging and dangerous things um, happening in, in these countries at the time, that I left the, the World Bank. I went home and I continued the work with uh, the people who had earlier committed themselves to work with me on this task force. And um, I very quickly found out what the real reason was for uh, the World Bank's reluctance to get involved. The reason was simply that the, most of the member countries of the World Bank, including Germany, including France, UK, Japan, Canada, uh, believed that corruption was uh, something unavoidable. Uh, corruption was part of a globalized economy where there was no governance, there was no regulation which had the authority to deal with uh, the global markets, and therefore uh, one simply had to fend for oneself. It was a free for all, and therefore, for instance, the German government allowed German companies to systematically bribe in Africa and Asia, Latin America. Huge amounts of money they uh, spent at the time. Uh, now the World Bank estimates that about a trillion dollars every year is spent on corrupt deals. In my opinion, the damage done to development is much more than these trillion dollars. It's a lot of money, but uh, the real damage was the perversion of um, economic uh, management, of economic decision making. Uh, the wrong projects were built, over-designed projects were built, uh, the macroeconomic policies of a country were perverted and, um, and therefore basically um, the projects uh, which were funded by the, de uh, the development partners uh, were doomed to failure because the reality of uh, the interaction between the, these former colonies and their metropolitan friends in Europe and everywhere in the world was such that uh, corruption totally destroyed um, the chances of building a sound economy in many of these countries. And I, we, I was convinced at the time that at least one third of the inter international indebtedness of the developing world was based on corruption, was based on the fact that the promoters, say, from big companies in Germany or the UK, they would go into the countries, they would tempt um, the decision makers, ministers, presidents, heads of parastatal companies to do the wrong things and uh, go home to their home countries and say in Africa, uh, in Asia, in Latin America, these people, they, they like corruption, they want corruption. So if you want to do business there, we have to live up to their expectations. Who are we to impose our sort of Judeo-Christian European values of honesty on, uh, on these people? 
So it's uh, our respect for the uh, local culture in the countries where we want to do business in, in China, in Nigeria, in Russia, which uh, forces us to allow our companies to systematically bribe. And when I say systematically, it is not uh, $500,000 for a minister or $5 million. It is uh, $10 million, $50 million uh, on Swiss bank accounts, on bank accounts. Well, you all read uh, nowadays about the, the Panama Papers to some tax havens and so on where, of course, the local decision makers uh, could expect that nobody ever finds out that suddenly they are rich, suddenly they can um, send their children to expensive schools like, like to Stanford, that suddenly they can go shopping in, in London, they can buy luxury apartments and, and yachts. Uh, and this is the reason why most of the leaders in Africa are much richer than the leaders of the rich countries. I mean, I, uh, if I look at the ministers in the German government, uh, none of them has a, has a yacht or none of them has, uh, has apartments in London and so on. But of course, uh, President Moyer at the time, who in a, in a wonderful way reinvented the term Letase Moyer you know, in, in Kenya, they were the richest people of the world. So the question was, what can one do? And uh, um, this was uh, uh, the experience which I would like to share with you. Because um, I wanted to have a conference in Berlin. I wanted to bring together these people who had promised to support me. Uh, I received from, from two development agencies in Germany um, 9,500 Deutschmarks each in order to organize a first conference. Uh, because these two development agencies were entitled to organize conferences without the permission of the ministry, as long as the money they spent was below 10,000 Deutschmarks. And so um, with this money, I invited people. They bought tickets and so on. We rented a room in one of the conference centers in Berlin. But uh, the uh, deputy minister of development in Germany, uh, whom I knew from earlier encounters, in fact, he has been flying around in the corporate airplane of, uh, uh, of Tiny Roland, whom the Africa connoisseurs among you uh, know he represented uh, 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 basically, um, uh, huge British interests, uh, neo or post colonial interests in plantations and so on in Kenya and other places. And he heard that I had received two times 9,500 Deutschmark. And he said, uh, if you add these two, it's more than 10,000. And so he intervened and stopped me. And so I had to write. Um, Emails, well, there were no emails at the time yet. I had to write to everybody and ask them uh, that we had to cancel the conference. Why? Because the German government wanted to continue um, this system of allowing German companies to systematically go out there and bribe uh, decision makers in Africa and Latin America and Asia and everywhere. So the question was, how do we overcome that hostility? And uh, I don't want to make a long story to to, to boring for you, but uh, uh, our idea was then to work together with civil society, other civil society organizations, with companies, um, and with uh, and the government. The governments in Africa and Asia and Latin America, but also the government in, in the home countries of our companies. And um, we organized three conferences. At that time, we had been invited already by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development by the OECD, which was trying, trying again under American uh, sponsorship to do something about international corruption. Because in the US, I should say, uh, Jimmy Carter had introduced the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977. So American companies were not allowed to bribe outside America. And um, of course, the American companies um, didn't like it. Uh, in particular, they didn't like that um, the companies from other countries continue to be allowed to do it. Uh, even got tax write-offs for it and subsidies and so on. And so the Americans had tried many, many times in the UN system, but also in regional banks, in the World Bank, in different places to introduce a system 
against international bribery, but they never succeeded because all the other companies, the other countries, the other member countries of the World Bank, they decided, well, uh, why are the Americans so stupid to not allow their companies to bribe? For us, this is a uh, wonderful competitive advantage. And therefore, for many, many years, for decades, uh, there was a real uh, uh, gap between the the ethics, I would say, of American companies and and uh, the other um, companies from rich uh, countries, uh, which um, officially allowed bribery and officially even were in giving this in their tax receipts. They would say, "I gave five million dollars to the mayor of Warsaw, or or ten million dollars to the minister of energy of of this country or that country," and then they could deduct this from their taxable income in Germany. It was a scandal. And um, so in that situation, I was trying to stand up and, uh, and our great hope was that we would explain to the private sector in Germany that for them it would be much better if they would be competing in a global market without corruption. Because they were offering good products, they were offering good prices, they were offering reliable deliveries, and therefore, for them, it would be much better if everybody would stop bribing at once. So we organized uh, three conferences on an island on the Wannsee. Uh, in fact, the first one was uh, even chaired by the former president of, uh, of Germany, Richard von Weizsäcker, uh, because uh, funnily, uh, the, the big companies like Siemens and MIN and Daimler Chrysler and RWB, they didn't dare to meet us because they thought, thought we would we would blame them and we would shame them somehow through our irresponsible activities. Uh, of course, many uh, companies feel that civil society organizations are mainly throwing bricks through the windows of, of McDonald's and so on, rather than have good arguments for better governance. In these three meetings, uh, over a course of two years, we basically convinced these business representatives that it would be uh, in their interest to participate at the OECD effort to reduce uh, international corruption. We were invited by the OECD again at the insistence of the Americans, of the Canadian um, uh, Secretary General of the OECD, much to the chagrin of the, of the German representative who always said that I'm offending them. They, they asked um, the OECD to not allow me to join uh, these conferences, but um, they were always outvoted by, uh, uh, by the other members of the OECD. So eventually, uh, we organized an open letter by these business people to uh, Helmut Kohl's government, asking the government, asking the Minister of, uh, of Commerce of, uh, of Germany to participate at the OECD effort to stop uh, foreign bribery. The same minister who had earlier said in public that you cannot stop bribery, that would mean uh, destruction of German, uh, German jobs, you know, as if the jobs of a corrupt company are more important than the jobs of an honest company. So this public letter just hit like a, a thunderbolt, the, the German politics. And um, uh, suddenly uh, the German government joined this effort at the OECD. In fact, they went further than the other members of the OECD. Uh, they demanded a, a binding, a mandatory um, uh, convention, uh, which um, the 33 members of the OECD would sign, uh, committing them to change their law, to make it a crime, to bribe in the international marketplace. Well, this was the absolute uh, victory of basically of our, of our effort. Because in 1997, the OECD Convention was signed. In 1999, it entered into force. In May 1999, uh, the Social Democrats had taken over the government in Germany. They very quickly uh, uh, abandoned this uh, tax deductibility of foreign bribes. And um, all of the other countries basically committed themselves to stop international bribery. So from one day to the other, we had the law on our side. Partly because we worked in many, many different uh, 
construction sites. I mean, in Germany, for instance, uh, we worked very hard with other NGOs. We worked very hard with the um, faith-based organizations, with um, academia. Many of the people who had earlier defended foreign bribery, uh, they now changed their minds and said, yes, bribery is so damaging. We have to stop. So in a way, we created a, a wave uh, which uh, and we could ride on the crest of that of that wave into a system where then the United Nations passed um, uh, its uh, anti-corruption convention. The World Bank, under the leadership of Jim Wolfenson, became a very, very tough anti-corruption agency. I mean, they totally changed and uh, turned from, from Saulus to Paulus. So in, in many ways, um, uh, the, the whole system has changed. But um, civil society still had to continue to look over the shoulder of governments and the private sector. Um, and uh, we saw that in some countries, like in Japan, for instance, practically nothing was done to enforce uh, the OECD convention. Even in the UK, um, uh, Tony Blair's government, who, who had been very verbally extremely supportive of the OECD convention, they didn't do anything to, uh, to implement it. In fact, uh, some of you may know this uh, really scandalous corruption case where um, British Aerospace had paid about 100,000, 100 million, 100 million pounds sterling every year to the son of the Saudi defense minister um, for 10 years, uh, basically um, uh, trying to organize a sale of 44 billion sterling worth of uh, military equipment to Saudi Arabia. Uh, of course, people, when they see now that uh, the king of Saudi Arabia uh, was one of the uh, people mentioned in the Panama Papers, they remember that. Uh, this was an, an, an amazing uh, corruption case. It was called El Yamama. And um, very interesting that Tony Blair felt that um, they should not prosecute it, even though they had committed themselves under the OECD convention. He stopped, his attorney general stopped the uh, serious fraud office in London. Uh, a number of NGOs, including Transparency International, our national chapter in the UK, um, appealed against this. They won in the high court in, in the UK. Uh, and therefore, uh, for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, uh, read the opinion of Chief Justice Cohen uh, of the High Court, who basically tore apart this argument that you shouldn't hurt uh, the Saudi uh, royal family, which, uh, which was uh, Tony Blair's argument. But then the government uh, of Tony Blair uh, appealed against that decision, and uh, the House of Lords decided that uh, uh, the Attorney General was right to stop this uh, prosecution. So this, was, this happened only about six years ago. And, um, uh, and it was only in the final months of the tenure of uh, the, the Blair government that in uh, the UK, the laws were changed basically to implement the obligations under the binding convention of the OECD of 1999. So in some countries, um, uh, the authorities were more um, diligent in prosecuting foreign bribery. In Germany, for instance, right now, we have about 120 companies, very, very respectable global companies which are being prosecuted in criminal proceedings uh, because they continued bribing in the international marketplace. I'm telling you this not in order to sort of uh, put dirt on my own country, but um, uh, to say how important it is that civil society remains involved. And in fact, this is probably one of the messages which I would very much like to convey to all of you, is, uh, it is none of the three actors of governance, uh, neither the governments of uh, nation states, nor the private sector itself, even the most powerful companies, uh, international companies, nor civil society alone can deal with the shortcomings of global governance. You need the three together. It's a, it's a magical triangle of good governance. And uh, in my opinion, this is the great hope of uh, overcoming what I would call 
failing governance in the globalized economy. Failing governance is a tough word, but it's, uh, if you look at the type of uh, world which we have created in the last couple of years, you know, the millions of refugees, the destruction of the environment, the poverty which still exists, the, uh, the disease and misery and bloodshed and so on in many parts of the world, we have to simply recognize we have allowed a global uh, economy to develop in a way that it is escaping any kind of, of uh, political uh, regulation. And, uh, and the reason is quite simple. We rely too much on national governments, on governments um, of nation states. And everybody knows that these governments don't have the global reach to deal with a, uh, a global market. They don't have the time horizon to deal with the real issues of, of global governance. And they are serving constituencies which are much diverse and much too splintered in order to develop a, a joint approach to address uh, global issues. And this is basically the context within which uh, uh, I have uh, made these experiences with Transparency International. I should be very honest, uh, at the beginning, uh, when we started Transparency International, I was not really familiar with this sort of powerful role which uh, uh, civil society organizations can play. Also in other areas, you know, human rights, you know, with Amnesty International, with Oxfam, in, in the environment, Greenpeace, and, uh, and so many organizations which operate, uh, driven by people, um, uh, and uh, uh, driven with the idea that they have to complement what governments and their international intergovernmental organizations can do, and uh, uh, trying to deal with uh, the private sector, which uh, normally has different mandates uh, than, the, than the common good. So this is basically what I uh, wanted to share with you with Transparency International. But it led then to um, uh, the creation of, of similar other institutions. I mean, for instance, at the end of my term at uh, Transparency International, uh, I left Transparency International as chair of Transparency International in uh, nine, uh, 2005, after 12 years. And uh, I'm now the chairman of the advisory council. But um, uh, I, at that time, then felt we have to be more systematic with approaching the, the risks and opportunities of civil society. So we created um, a, a think tank, which was called the Berlin Civil Society Center. Again, um, I brought together people from all over the world interested in trying to um, uh, focus on the strengths of civil society and what the uh, requirement would be in order to make them a uh, legitimate voice uh, for, for the common good. And uh, I worked for a whole year funded by the Vodafone Foundation uh, to develop a feasibility study of creating such a civil society center. But at the end of the year, um, the Vodafone Foundation refused to fund the creation of it. They only funded the, the study. And uh, so therefore, I thought I have to give it up. I feel that uh, the foundation was mainly shocked by the idea that I said, we will not accept any limitation on what we do with our civil society center. In particular, we might even look at uh, electromagnetic um, waves and so on, which may be harmful to the people. And, and they said, no, 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 this is something which we, uh, which we do ourselves. You know? So um, eventually, I had this wonderful feasibility study, but no money to, to create it. And I had already talked to the head of uh, Save the Children in London. I had said, you can come and become my managing director. Um, and uh, so I called him, I said, I'm sorry, the thing is off. We don't get the money. And he said, I'm coming anyhow. So I'm coming and join you uh, free of charge. And the two of us will set this up together. And you have to promise me that once we get money, once we get support, that I will get a nice salary as a, as a managing director. And I, I promised this to him. And he was great. He invented, for instance, an idea of funding this, which, which is uh, 
uh, uh, pure genius. Uh, we basically sold our own shares to big civil society organizations, Amnesty International, to Oxfam, to uh, Save the Children. Uh, all of them had to pay $10,000 a year to own our center. And uh, that gave us enough money for him to pay himself and his uh, staff uh, a salary. So this is sort of one idea which I can recommend. You know, try to set something up and then sell it to the people who would be the beneficiaries of it. Um, then the next thing <coughs> came my way was um, the need to do something in oil and gas, uh, in mining because this is an area where corruption is particularly vicious uh, because uh, there's a lot of money um, uh, playing a, a role in, in, in that sector. If you build a, um, a, uh, a platform, an oil platform, in the territorial waters say, of Equatorial Guinea, you very quickly pay three, four billion dollars. And therefore, of course, Exxon, uh, which uh, is um, uh, very active in Equatorial Guinea. They have the idea uh, we need stability, we need uh, predictability, that we can make uh, enough money in order to recover our investment. And um, so for the companies to bribe is extremely tempting. And of course for a, a president like President Gema, who, um, uh, who uh, uh, has uh, practically no prospect, has a very small salary, he, he cannot um, send his children to good universities and he doesn't know whether he will be killed like he killed his uncle when he came to power. Um, the idea of uh, building up a, uh, a, a trust fund somewhere in, in the Bahamas or in Panama and so on is extremely tempting. So in this area of extractive industries, Corruption is particularly vicious, and you have to approach very uh, special uh, ideas, which we did at the time, to set up the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. By now, we have about 51 countries which report every year uh, in reliable reports uh, resulting from deliberations of multi-stakeholder working groups in the country, again, including this magical triangle I have been mentioning um, uh, about the payments of uh, uh, oil and gas and mining companies to their host countries. In many countries, uh, huge amounts of money. In Nigeria, $50 billion, $54 billion one year. Uh, money which normally is kept secret uh, by the power elites in the country. So that it's not surprising that right now, for instance, the new president of Nigeria has uh, suddenly found that $23 billion has fallen between the cracks. You know, they don't know where it is. Um, so this is being changed by creating a multi-stakeholder transparency project for oil and gas. And this in turn is uh, so encouraging that uh, we are now trying to create similar transparency projects in, in fisheries, uh, where many coastal countries in Africa, for instance, suffer from the fact that huge fishing fleets from China, from Russia, from Spain, come and basically catch the fish which uh, the traditional fishermen can, cannot find anymore with, with, with huge consequences. I, I, I see you. So, um, uh, I mean, these kind of transparency projects, uh, including also one in the garment sector, you know, after the Rana Plaza accident in Bangladesh, we are trying to do the same thing in the in garment sector. Um, in my opinion, are a, uh, a hope for creating uh, better governance, but it has to be uh, moderate. One has to find common interest of these three actors, government, civil society, and private sector. One has to gradually build up their ambition to, uh, to find more um, normative standards, like they are doing in the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative right now. And, um, and I have the feeling this is a way which can uh, lead to, to better governance. But it means, of course, that civil society has to, uh, to shape up itself. It has to have civil NGOs, have to have more transparent 
governance themselves. You know, they have to um, account for their funds. They have to account for their decision-making processes. They have to be competent. I mean, many NGOs are not very competent, so they mobilize people on the street, like in the case of Brand Spa, for instance, uh, uh, Greenpeace has done, uh, to promote a campaign which in the final analysis uh, was not very, I mean, uh, the content was not very, uh, very useful. And perhaps uh, most importantly, civil society organizations have to learn to work with the other actors. I mean, in America, many civil society organizations are very shy to uh, work with governments. They feel they lose their independence if they work with government, if they accept money from government. Uh, in Europe, uh, many NGOs are uh, scared to deal with the private sector. Uh, we at Transparency International, we basically take money and support from everywhere. You know? So uh, when you are leaving the room, we are going to make a collection here from all of you. <laughs> no, but the point is, uh, I really feel you have to have a system of protecting your independence, your reputation, of uh, not being in the pocket of, of anybody um, and have to work with uh, the other actors. On the other hand, the other actors have to also allow civil society to work. I mean, right now, we have a huge problem that in many countries, in particular in authoritarian countries like Russia and Ethiopia and uh, Angola, that the space of civil society is severely limited. I mean, civil society activists are harassed, they're put in jail, and um, therefore um, uh, we have to learn to harness the benefits of this magical triangle which I've been mentioning. If we succeed to do this, I think we can hope for a, possibly for a better world which is more fair and more peaceful and more just than uh, what we have right now. Well, there was 42 minutes. Is this okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Are you going to? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Yeah. Uh, could you repeat that question because I didn't acoustically sorry, quite get it. How, yeah. sorry, how effective are laws like the Foreign Corrupt Practices ah, yeah. Act and what could be done, if anything, to make them more effective? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the, the American Foreign Corrupt Practices Act <coughs> was extremely effective. I mean, I remember I was... Um, um, I was um, close to some people from Siemens, and um, they were visiting us in Washington, and they said this is nonsense, you know, that the Americans are now introducing this, because uh, all of our projects, you know, in, in Latin America, in Paraguay, or in Argentina, or in Venezuela, and so on, we all have to, always have to pay the local decision makers. and. Um, and in fact, um, they felt that uh, they would have to go into some kind of coalition with American companies who were not allowed to pay uh, bribes in order to uh, together then get contracts. And the Germans or the Brits or the French would do the, the bribing. Now, uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is quite smart in the sense that um, they demand due diligence. They demand that uh, American companies have to try to make sure there's no corruption involved, in particular when they have local partners. Very often uh, they think that the local partners can, can do the, the bribing and they reap the benefits. But um, the, the Justice Department and the, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, which are enforcing in the United States the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, are, are pretty... Uh, tough, and their, their, their penalties are very high. I mean, now they are in the billions. In fact, uh, they also punish companies which are registered in the United States on the, on the stock exchanges. So Siemens, for instance, uh, is listed on the stock exchange in the United States, and therefore they, 
uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is applied to them. Uh, they had to pay about $200 million in fines in Germany, Siemens, but they had to pay about a billion dollars in fines in the US. You know. And they took American lawyers to basically uh, arrange a settlement with, uh, with the Justice Department. Uh, so the, um, uh, I think the, the implementation uh, was very helpful. But um, of course, the Americans over time became very angry, the American business community, that uh, very often they would be in a competitive situation with German, British, French, Japanese companies. And they knew the others had paid bribes. And therefore, they were pretty um, devious, the American companies, and finding ways to uh, have the same effect. So at one point in uh, uh, 2003 or so, we, or even a little earlier than that, we organized a um, bribe payers index. I mean, many of you may know the corruption perception index, which we do every year. But uh, we organized the bribe payers index, which was measuring the propensity of companies from um, various countries, from exporting countries to bribe, basically 20 uh, exporting countries. And um, uh, I remember the MacArthur Foundation was funding that. And uh, after a while, we came with the results. And to the great shock of the Americans, they found that the American companies were uh, worse than in our ranking than the French and the Germans. You know. I mean, the Americans had a very, very strong sort of moral sense of superiority that they said, well, you Germans, you, you are conspiring in crime. You know, you're dealing with these dictators, with these kleptocrats over around the world. We, however, we are honest. And in our index, which came out of this, the Americans ranked behind the French, behind the Germans. So it was a huge shock, uh, huge shock for them. So at least this um, index, which we repeat every two years, showed that the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is not quite as, uh, uh, as uh, effective as, uh, as the Americans wanted it to be. And uh, many of you know that there were huge American corruption cases. Uh, Boeing was caught, uh, uh, IBM was caught in Argentina, and so on. So in many ways, um, I'm afraid the American Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was uh, very good in intention. And it was also very good in helping us to introduce something similar in other countries. Particular one thing I found particularly harmful was that uh, the American business community insisted in the early 80s that um, facilitation payments should be allowed. And they are allowed under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Facilitation payments are payments which are small, uh, $500, $1,000 or so. Uh, to basically facilitate uh, actions of um, uh, of uh, civil society uh, of um, uh, public officials outside the the country, um, which are in themselves not illegal. So, if uh, say the captain of a ship pays to the director of a port a thousand dollars to 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 get say perishable. Um, goods uh, unloaded uh, during the weekend or something like that. This is a typical facilitation payment. We at Transparency International, we didn't tolerate that. We thought this was has a tremendous distorting effect and therefore we would not allow it. And just to give you a, a little bit of a sense how difficult our work is because the American companies uh, who are uh, uh, trying to work with us, they say we work with you, but we want to have the right to pay facilitation payments. And we said, no, you cannot. If you want to apply our index, uh, our standards for business, our code of conduct, there's no allowance for facilitation payments. On that basis, then, um, the organizer of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, he told me, um, if uh, you don't allow this under your guidelines, I will start my own guidelines where my American members of the World Economic Forum, they get a clear permit for facilitation payments. So they developed PACHI, which is uh, a special World, World Economic Forum um, uh, standard competing with ours, uh, 
which allows facilitation payments, and therefore all American companies and so on are trying to, to adopt this. So the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act has a sort of Achilles heel, but um, basically I'm very, very grateful to Jimmy Carter to have uh, pushed this after the Watergate affair. In fact, he is on my advisory council, and, uh, and I'm very proud of that. Yes, ma'am. They have totally changed. I mean, the, during uh, the first, um, um, I would say, four years of our existence, they have been fighting us. In particular, the legal department, they said what we are proposing is illegal under the charter of the World Bank. We were trying to get a system of blacklisting of companies that are caught bribing. And uh, I mean, we feel in general that uh, criminal sanctions are a very blunt weapon because you have the burden of proof. It's very hard to uh, convict somebody uh, in a criminal proceeding. But there are other legal instruments like, for instance, um, uh, blacklisting of companies where you don't have the burden of proof. You just uh, can uh, present a high probability that, that something has happened. And uh, we wanted the World Bank to put in place a uh, blacklisting system where whenever they find some companies uh, bribing, they exclude them from future uh, bidding for World Bank finance projects. And the legal department was just hitting the roof because uh, one of the golden rules of the World Bank is that all companies that operate from the territories of members of the World Bank get free access to uh, compete for World Bank finance projects. And uh, in my opinion, it was a totally stupid uh, legal decision of the legal department. I myself had been working in the legal department of the World Bank. I, in fact, I drafted the procurement guidelines of the World Bank in, in, in 1969. So I know quite a bit about this. And of course, um, through a blacklist system, you, you strengthen the competitiveness and you don't exclude and reduce the competition. But um, at the time, the, the general counsel of the World Bank was doing everything to snuff us off the table. And, uh, and we, uh, we were really um, uh, the enemy number one of the, of the World Bank. Interesting for the Americans among you, Robert McNamara, who had been the uh, president of the World Bank, he joined me. He came to our uh, launch in 1993 to Berlin. And in fact, he said this idea of uh, creating integrity pacts uh, in corrupt situations, in competitive situations, is great. And I will give you $10,000 out of my own pocket if you get the first uh, countries to accept this inst uh, instrument. Now, he went with me to six different presidents in Africa. And these presidents demanded from the World Bank that their World Bank finance projects should be under this rule of uh, uh, first of all, um, having an integrity pact where all competitors have to agree, have to have an anti-corruption compliance system, but also have to promise not to bribe and have to, in fact, accept sanctions in case they are caught bribing. And, um, uh, and secondly, uh, to have this uh, sort of blacklisting system. And, uh, and he was furious uh, during the last years of his life that the World Bank did not do this. And, then came uh, Jim Wolfensohn, uh, and Jim Wolfensohn became a tremendous supporter of Transparency International. We had a, a whole day of uh, joint seminars about corruption um, in, uh, in June 1996. And uh, in fact, in October of that year, Jim Wolfensohn gave the speech in, in Hong Kong about the cancer of corruption. And after that, he invited us, uh, our people, from Berlin, but also from other parts of the world, to come into the World Bank and try to introduce anti-corruption mechanisms in a lot of the World Bank's um, uh, sectoral and, and macroeconomic policies. So it was an amazing, uh, amazing story. So the World Bank has um, joined the anti-corruption um, uh, community, uh, 
But uh, for a long time, uh, the, the mass of the people, the middle level management of the World Bank, they didn't participate in this. You know, I remember I visited people in, in, in my own country, in, in Kenya, you know, where I had to be the, the, the regional director. And, and the people there would say, look, if we find corruption in one of our contracts, in one of our projects, we don't tell anybody. You know, because we don't want our projects to be held up. You know, we, these guys in Washington, they don't know what they are talking about. So uh, we, will, we will not stop a project in the education sector, in the health sector, where we have been working for years. And suddenly we see a little bit of corruption of the wife of the minister or something like that. We are not stupid enough to stop our, our projects and, uh, and destroy uh, the lives of, uh, of 100,000 school children who don't get uh, to go to school and so on. So, I mean, there's this kind of... Uh, uh, trade-off which we saw and there were some parts of the World Bank I mean for instance in Indonesia there was a director who said uh, Suharto is stealing money right and left 30 billion dollars his family but um, he's also fighting poverty so uh, millions of people are rising out of poverty so uh, it's a small price we pay uh, why who cares whether Suharto is rich or poor so, I mean, and these people were then fired afterwards. So, right now, there is a very, very tough uh, system. And in fact, under Wolfowitz, it became even tougher. And, um, and I think under Zerlik and now under Jim Kim, the anti-corruption uh, guideline is really, uh, uh, has arrived at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much for coming. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm.